Awakening from the slumber of consumer society and into a connection with the land is a special journey. I Don't Know More leader Sylvia McAdam describes coming into relationship with the land as much like falling in love. The beloved pervades your every thought, grounds you in bliss, and constantly calls your energy toward union. Sylvia fell in love with the traditional hunting lands of her people, the Plains Cree, and she protests against those who would despoil the sacred lands of her people. She devotes innumerable hours to I Don't Know More and inspires others to fall in love with landscape. Idle No More has prompted me to come into right relationship with the land and natural systems, and that is why I chose to study Anthropology 610 through Athabasca and Spirit of the Land through Augustana this semester. The first step to right relationship is reflecting on and understanding my own way of being on the earth. By exploring numerous traditions in land relationship, I have found foils to the dominant yet deficient view of land as subservient to economic agents and scientific ways of knowing. As doors of time, space, and spirit fall open within me, I've caught glimpses of a healing bond between my being and the living systems that nurture me unconditionally. When I open these doors, in floods the weight of my own reality. I am not a stationary being by nature. I have spent nearly half my adult life traversing the globe, knowing multiple landscapes on a surface level, and rarely being present long enough to experience even a full turn of the seasons. How can I be in relationship with a place if I'm always absent? Can I find a value outside of a deep, static, and lasting connection to a particular landscape? These questions lead me to seek out nomadic peoples to understand how First Nations nomads hold connection to multiple landscapes. I don't pursue this knowledge to appropriate it in a colonial way, but to show, follow in humility those traditional practices that bring me into right relationship with natural systems and that reintroduce me to my own essential place in Gaia. The Evenk people are one group among numerous northern tribes of Siberia whose nomadic lifestyle is part of their intimate connection with reindeer. Traditional reindeer herding in the forbidding Siberian landscape requires following the natural migratory patterns of the animals. Grazing lands, birthing grounds, and pest-free highlands are spaces ancient generations of reindeer have explored and passed down through a genetic disposition to roam. The Avenki honor this ancient knowledge by moving through the taiga with the herd, using them largely for transportation as they exploit hunting, trapping, and fishing areas throughout the north. Prior to Soviet intervention, the nomadic lifestyle was a defining feature of the Avenki culture with status reflected by the number of reindeer in a family's herd. It was only those who had lost all their reindeer, and with it their ability to sustain themselves on the land, who adopted a sedentary lifestyle. Accordingly, these stationary individuals were considered the most impoverished of the community, and it was widely believed they had incurred disfavor of the natural world by maintaining an improper relationship to the land. Despite the prevailing view of nomadic peoples as vagrant, the lifestyle demands a heightened connection to the land. While the Evenki procured sustenance and a modest income from hunting sable, wild reindeer, fox, muskrat, and fishing salmon and gathering berries and mushrooms depending on the territorial offerings of the area, enduring traditions prescribe the need to observe the proper seasons for harvesting. In contrast to the consumer relationship to nature that dominates the Russian mentality, Evenki tradition dictates you can hunt and trap, but you have to respect nature. This is not a store. These traditions, passed orally for generations, guide right relationship with the land and include such maxims as do not kill before all the food is gone, and to exterminate a whole brood of birds or young animals is a serious sin. Also included in tradition are proper observations of the reciprocity of relationship with the land requiring items to be left in exchange for what is taken, and guiding the treatment of living animals under various circumstances. 
Within the nomadic tradition, relationship to the land is a visceral thing. There are nature-bound consequences to breaking Evenki laws. Hunters are especially careful to repeat practices in order to ensure the next successful hunt. Evenki traditions not only guide interactions between humans and nature, but also dictate proper behavior toward other humans. Proper protocol when leaving a site, when coming upon another's trap lines, when procuring a large kill, or customs authorizing the use of any tools, as well as the requirement that all storage spaces are kept unlocked, are equally part of the integral relationships built on the land. The Evenki customs of mutual assistance, sharing, knowing how to be content with little, and the absence of envy can be seen as reflections of the natural world played out in human relationship. As Evenki do not see humans as separate from nature, maintaining proper relations within society is as integral as observing protocol with nature. The promotion of sharing, community responsibility, and assistance seemed an easy inroad for Soviet expansion into the area though a negation of the integral role of nature's systems proved to be detrimental to the Evenki traditions, as outlined in the following section. Traditional Evenki land customs didn't involve the legal ownership of land as such. Within the belief system of the people, the lands were merely on loan from the master of the land or the place to those who exercised proper use. Continued connection between a family or clan and a grazing area determined the rights to use a particular space, but the borders between lands was fluid, and in times of scarcity, land was shared in order to ensure the survival of all, both human and reindeer. Land was viewed as temporarily occupied when evidenced by various signs of use, including items left in temporary settlements and special markings on trees along migration routes. But these spaces were available for necessary use by other families or clans. Some lands were prohibited from use by all. They were sacred lands which housed grave sites and spirits or were touched by disease or war. While land use was somewhat communal, notions of one's own land or ancestral land persists to this day and reflects a sense of home. When Soviet expansion into Evenki territory began in earnest during the 1930s and 40s, systems of cooperation on the land were exploited in order to bring the Evenki closer to the Soviet ideal of the state-owned collective farm. Initially, clans were brought together to form kolkhozes, collective reindeer herding operations that brought varying families and clans into cooperation and herding activities. From here, the formation of sovkolkhozy or state farms transferred ownership of the reindeer into state hands and restructured the family herders into reindeer brigades who cared for the animals though they were no longer the private owners of the reindeer. Alongside this economic restructuring, sedentarization was an important agenda item for the Soviets and settlements were established alongside state farms. A small number of Russians moved into the area to take over administrative details and schooling, and increasingly women and children came to live in the settlements. These communities often consisted of a few wooden buildings with numerous Evenki tents, and their mobi mobility set the stage for the next step of consolidation, which brought numerous small-scale farms together into more economically viable centers. The larger centers saved the Soviet central government the cost of distributing goods and services to multiple remote settlements and drew Evenki herders farther from their traditional nomadic practices. This process of disruption impacted not only the social structure and traditions of the Evenki, it also led to the formation of an economic rather than a subsistence relationship with the land. Traditional family herders who typically pastured less than a hundred reindeer were transformed into brigades that led several hundred reindeer. In the Evenki case, reindeer typically reared for transportation were now being cultivated for food and furs. In addition, the consolidation of different herds and the establishment of new pastoral routes brought reindeer themselves under Soviet rule. At one time, these herds had roamed large tracts of the northern landscapes but were now forced to graze on a few select spaces. This did more than just lead to overgrazing in numerous areas. 
natural patterns of the reindeer, including the proclivity to return to established calving grounds, prove difficult to restructure. When you drive the reindeer from place to place, says one woman, how many deer you lose? The cost of non-native administration of the reindeer is mirrored in gender-related labor division that negates the importance of Avenki women in herding practices. Traditionally, women tended the calves, tied them up. The cows came, they milked them and let the calves loose, says one woman. One could draw a fascinating correlation between the declining herds and the detrimental effects of removing the essential feminine from herding practices, both in the form of Gaia and the Avenki women. Suffice to say, the high input of energy, both in goods and administration, of the Soviet project rewrote the social structure of all Avenki actors, human, land, and animal. Sometimes reconciliation is born of necessity rather than an outright desire to mend relationship. And it can be argued that post-Soviet Russia's resolution with northern peoples was precipitated by an essential economic contraction of the state. State subsidies that had supported the collective farms and guaranteed markets for reindeer products were no longer available as the political climate shifted. While numerous national and international groups had been pressuring the state to restructure the relationship with First Nations, calling the previous policies ethnocidal, we are remiss if we do not acknowledge the political and economic impacts that facilitated land redistribution. This concession will be especially important when we look at renewed threats to the North in the next section. Whether economics or ethics based, land reform for Russia's northern tribes has heralded a return to the importance of ties to the land. Areas previously occupied by state farms have been open to obshinchitin, or family clan claims. Land restructuring is facilitating a resurgence of Evenki cultural traditions, as groups consisting of family clan relations are able to petition for land that had been taken over by its Soviet collectivization. Evenki making land claims are required to return to re traditional activities, including hunting, trapping, fishing, and reindeer herding, and must demonstrate connection to the land over other territorial claims. As with collectivization, post-Soviet land restructuring has suffered numerous complications. Some of these arise when the competing claims for land from various historical users Evenki tradition dictates that one must maintain occupation and use of pastoral lands in order to exercise land rights, but generations have been dislocated from family lands in order to serve the reindeer brigades on varying state-owned farms. Individuals making land claims find themselves in competition with those who have used the land in the meantime, either on other state enterprise farms or in a few cases as part of household farms that escaped Soviet integration. According to Avenki tradition, these new users exercise user rights, even though it was political circumstances that removed the original herding families from the land. On occasion, land use is allocated to more than one family for different purposes, as in the case of Uluki v. Oron, in which one family clan was given pastoral use and the other hunting rights on overlapping land. Such disputes can stall the land allocation process and may complicate the return of Avenki youth to land occupied by generations long past. It is interesting to examine land reallocation on the basis of what it excludes, land, use, and people. First, in varying nations, the separation of humans and nature has led to the establishment of national park areas where human action is largely removed from the landscape. Russia is no different, having established two types of federally controlled preservation areas. That the Zapovnik, where all human activity is restricted, and national parks focused on tourism and recreational use. While some of these lands were traditionally exploited by the Evenk people, they are now unavailable for petition. What's more, some of the protect protected lands intersect migration routes or lay adjacent to established claims, especially during periods of economic hardship when land use turns towards supplying basic needs for food infringement upon the rich lands of protected areas turns subsistence users into criminals. Finally, the parks themselves are changing, allowing a few ecologically benign tourists to visit the Zepovdyniak 
and allowing mineral exploration in the national parks. Second, petitions for land exclude all but traditional resource utilization, leaving culturally significant sites, such as shamanistic sites and burial grounds, open. The sacred space of event people are restricted from use within the culture and are not requested for economic uses, leaving the exploitation of these lands to non event often Russian people. And finally, as mentioned, women are underrepresented in the land claim process due to both event tradition and Soviet disruption. The event follow a patrilineal tradition, and the majority of women who do petition for land are those married to non event men. Additionally, the legacy of Soviet sedentarization has removed the essential participation of women in hunting and herding, which is the basis of traditional use upon which claims are founded. The return of the land to the First Nations of Russia may seem a great boon to rectify wrongs of the state, but it's important to note that while groups may enjoy usufruct use over their land allocation, ownership of the land remains in state hands. Land is only granted for a 25-year period, and only for use as specified in the charter of the Obshinshini. Critics argue that the move is simply a way for the state to curb privatization of land while appearing progressive. Taxation practices seem to support that claim, with Obshinshini enjoying a three-year tax-free period, followed by an increase to 53%. Economic hardships leave space for resource extraction industries oil and gas, mining, to manipulate the Obshinshini into lo allowing land use. Though the Evenka are only paid for the use of the land and not for the resources extracted. All this, alongside reduced subsidies from the central government, makes the move toward land reform seem a fading promise from a government in transition. As the Russian government stabilizes the economy and opens to capitalist development, interest is increasingly turning to the unexploited north, a position reflected in other nations around the Arctic Circle. Battles have been won and lost as corporate greed encounters the ecological balance and sacred relationship between the Evenki and the natural world. The diversion of the northern Baikal pipeline around reindeer calving and pasturing grounds at a cost of over a billion dollars was a small victory of the Evenk over corporate interest, but more recent trends remain troublesome. After being shut down for years, the Baikal pulp mill has restarted production after prohibitions on waste were lifted in the Lake Baikal ecological region, which hosts the world's largest freshwater lake. Oil and gas exploration is increasing as Russia experienced the first successful winter sailing of liquid natural gas through the Northeast Passage and to Asia. Mining exploration, including the contested Dailacha Jade Mine adjacent to an Evenki Obashinya claim, continues to be developed. While industry inroads into the north is a cause for concern in itself, Recent moves by the Russian federal government hints at more difficult times to come. Since its inception in 1991, the Russian Association of Indigenous Peoples of North Siberia and Far East, or RAPON, has represented various Russian First Nations groups, including the Evenk, in both federal and international forums. RAPON holds a permanent Indigenous participant space on the Arctic Council, acts as a special consultant to the United Nations Economic and Social Council, and is closely tied with the Norwegian Barent Secretariat. Rapon has consistently fought for indigenous rights and legal interests, resisting development in the traditionally protected lands essential to the cultures of the North. Many argue that it is Rapon's vocal opposition to development of the North that led to its suspension in the fall of 2012. The Russian government enforced a six-month shutdown of the indigenous body due to a bureaucratic issue with its organizational charter. The timing of this suspension coincided with a number of important meetings involving the northern nations and their indigenous communities, including a meeting of the Arctic Council, of which Canada is the new chair, and suggest that Russia sees an underrepresented indigenous population as advantageous in these situations. While international backlash reinstated Rapon before the six-month term elapsed, 
the Russian government's disregard for indigenous groups suggests that further legislation over land use will consider corporate interests more heavily than it has in the past. My research into the Evenki of Russia has helped me understand the speed at which the Idle No More movement spread throughout the world. Encroachment of international industry into the resource-rich northern regions unites First Nations around the Arctic Circle, as these historically marginalized peoples are submitted to a new onslaught against their traditions and practices. Families of Evenk who have been exiled from their homeland for generations have barely settled in before corporate greed threatens to remove them once again. Perhaps due to environmental degradation, this time it will be for good. In learning about the Evenki traditions, I have found a few parallels between their nomadic ways and my own. While my territory is vast and my travel is solitary, the non-material requirements of a nomadic lifestyle, as well as the social values of sharing and disdain for greed that are central to Evenki culture, ring true to my own way of being. In Evenki tradition, movement to the next place is a calling from the place to come, Rather than, rather than an abandonment of the place where one is. The Evenk leave a place knowing they will return the next year, and with their return they will reconnect with the time, space, and being of that place. Just as with human relationship, respect for natural spaces is imperative if one hopes to be welcomed upon return.